So today we're going to talk about waterside HVAC, <clears throat> uh, specifically heating systems. So far, we've been looking at the air side part of HVAC, and now we're going to shift into the water side, which is intertwined with what's going on on the air side, but is kind of its own beast. Not all systems in HVAC have a water side component, but many of them do. And recall when we're talking about HVAC, virtually every system you look at has some form of heating and some form of cooling. And as a reminder, our typical heating sources that we might see, and we've talked about several of these, electric resistance, natural gas fired, heat pump, which we just had a whole lecture on air source heat pumps, which is all refrigerant based. And a big one that's going to be the focus of today is hot water. So today it's all about water side heating systems. If you have a hot water system, in your building, that's going to contain a centralized hot water plant. And on the next slide, I'll have more of a visual representation of what this looks like. The hot water plant usually is going to have at least two boilers. It, it is possible to have a single boiler. Uh, normally, you see at least two boilers with the idea being if one of those boilers goes down, you can still run the other boiler and have some heating for your building. Even if you can't maintain the building at say 70 degrees, you can still prevent your pipes from freezing. So that's the reason why there's usually at least two boilers. Whereas if you only had one boiler and that boiler goes down, now you've lost heat for your entire building. And if that's in the middle of winter, you can be in big trouble. So these two boilers or more, they are producing hot water, typically in the range of 140 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. The boiler can have all kinds of fuels, natural gas, electric resistance, propane, fuel oil, heat pump, basically all of the typical heating sources we've talked about so far, that could be what's heating the water in your boiler you're going to have a circulation pump or often two circulation pumps for the same reason we talked about having multiple boilers. If one of those pumps goes down, you still have this other pump for redundancy that you can still turn on. And so those pumps, those are going to pump the hot water from the boilers and send it out into the system out into the building to actually heat the building. And then heat energy is going to get pulled out of the hot water through hot water coil or <clears throat> hot water coils at our air handlers and then delivered to an airstream and then sent out into the space. And then the water, which is going to be a bit colder. So I mentioned we're sending it out at 140 to 180 it's going to come back a bit colder, say 110 to 160. It's going to come back to the central plant where the boiler can heat it up again and then send it back out into the building. So visually, this is essentially what that looks like. So we have our boiler or boilers, usually more than one, where we're taking cold-ish. It's, it's still warm water, but um, when it's coming back, it's, it's colder than when it's leaving. So we're taking coldish water from the system on this side, and then it's going to heat it up within the boiler and then send it back out into the system. So our hot water supply, again, is in that 140 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what we are sending out into the building. That triangle with a circle around it, that's the common symbol for a pump. And the direction of the triangle is telling you the flow direction. <clears throat> so our water is getting pumped out of the boiler and sent out down into the system. And that's 
the device that's going to move the hot water through the building loop. Within our air handlers, we have our hot water coils, which we'll take a closer look at here in a moment. But the hot water coils, that's what we are running our hot water through, which is going to heat up our supply air before we send it out into the space. So we're sending hot water through these solid red lines. <clears throat> we're losing some of that heat energy to heat up the airstream. And then in the dashed lines, it's coming back a little bit colder from every single one of these coils. And so our hot water return will be 20 to 30 degrees lower than whatever our supply is. So if we are supplying at 180 degrees and it's coming back at say 150, well, that's still not cold water. So we'll, we'll say it's relatively cold just in relation to the supply. And that's the basics of a hot water system. So in this case, I'm only showing three air handling units with three heating coils. A typical hot water system would have dozens of coils, maybe even you know 100 heating coils out there throughout the building with hot water supply and return piping distributed to all of that equipment. But all of that would come back to a central plant where you have your boilers and your pumps that serve the entire building. This is what a typical hot water coil will look like. So we have copper piping. That's what our hot water is running through. And you can see there's multiple passes going through here. You can't really see it on the inside of the coil, but you can kind of think about the pipe coming in, taking a turn at the end here, coming back. And it just takes what's called a serpentine path, just back and forth, back and forth until it leaves the coil. And then running vertically within this coil, and this is where the air is actually getting pushed through the coil in the air handling unit, you're going to have a number of aluminum fins to facilitate that heat transfer. So those fins are, they're all uh, fused to the copper pipe. And really that just gives you more surface area to help heat transfer. We're going to send in our hot water supply on one of these stubs. So our hot water supply is coming in, nice hot temperature. We're gonna blow some cold air into one side of the coil and it's going to leave as hot air on the other side. And then our hot water return is going to come out the other stub colder than when it came in. Quick side note, talking about steam systems. So, so far we've been talking about hot water, but uh, I want to have a brief aside to talk about steam. Older systems often operate with a steam system instead of hot water. Fundamentally, it's the same process, same principle. The coils in your system are going to look very similar to what we just looked at, but instead of running hot water through your coils, you're running steam. Now, steam systems aren't that common when we're talking about new construction. And most buildings nowadays are moving to hot water over steam. That's not to say there aren't some applications where steam boilers are used in new construction, but uh, they're, they're becoming less and less common as time goes on. The reason that there's been this big push to go to hot water systems is because steam systems are usually pretty high maintenance. They're really not as efficient as hot water boilers. They're highly prone to leaks and that leads into the maintenance issue uh, as well as the efficiency issue. The more leaks you have in your system, the less efficient your system is going to be. And there are some potential safety concerns with having pressurized steam. There are some, some pretty gnarly horror stories of people 
getting seriously hurt with steam if a, a pressurized steam system fails and you get a blast of steam in your face that's definitely going to leave a mark one difference though with steam systems is that they do not require a pump which means you don't have to maintain a pump and there's also no energy use with that pump in a steam system, the boiler just creates the steam and then that steam just naturally fills the pipes just by nature of how when you turn that steam, uh, well, it's, it's a gas. So when you create that, it's going to fill whatever volume it can, which is going to be the pipes in the system. When we're talking about hot water systems, I've been throwing around this term boiler, which really isn't quite the right term if we're talking about a hot water system because a hot water boiler actually isn't boiling the water. If we're only heating that up to 180 degrees, that is not boiling. You know, you'd have to get that up to 212 degrees to hit that boiling point. But this term boiler stuck around from the steam days. Like I said, a hot water system fundamentally operates on the same principles as a steam boiler. It's just using lower temperature hot water instead of uh, superheated steam. And the term just kind of stuck, even if it's not really a right term. A more accurate term would probably be a hot water heater. But then that makes you think of a domestic hot water heater. So maybe that's another reason why they didn't want to use that term. This course, mainly today, this lecture specifically, will mainly be focusing on hot water systems, but just be aware of steam systems that are out there and how they work. And this is a potential HVAC upgrade. I've been involved on many projects where we've gone in and a customer has an old steam system and they want to convert the system to hot water. So let's talk about heat transfer. The driving equation for water side heat transfer is this, and that's Q in BTUs per hour equals 500 times GPM times the delta T of the water. GPM being gallons per minute. So that is referring to the water flow that's moving through our hot water system. The delta T, that's going to be the temperature difference of the water coming in versus the water coming out. So if you were to look at a hot water coil, you have some hot water going in and some colder water coming out, that'll be your delta T. Or you could be looking at the boiler. If you wanted to look at the entire system and you're focusing on the central boiler, if you know the flow through the boiler and you know the temperature in and the temperature out, you can solve for Q in BTU per hour. This equation has the same derivation as the air side heat transfer equation, which is that 1.08 times CFM times delta T that you should be fairly familiar with at this point. Fundamentally, it's derived the same way for this water side equation, except now we're dealing with the density of water and we are basing our mass on gallons per minute instead of cubic feet per minute. So if you walk through all those steps, you come to this multiplier of about 500 rather than the 1.08 uh, when we're talking about air side heat transfer. So a quick example, if we have a hot water coil that we're heating some airstream, so let's say through that coil, we are moving 15 gallons per minute. It's coming in at 180 degrees Fahrenheit and it's leaving at 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have a 20 degree temperature change. And the question is, what's the heat transfer for this coil. If we run through that equation we just talked about, 500 times 15 times 180 minus 160, 
we find out that this coil is transferring 150,000 BTUs per hour. So that is what is being transferred from the coil into the airstream. So now we know that 150,000 BTUs per hour is leaving the water and entering the air. And now we can take that info and now revisit our air side equations. So let's say our airflow going through this coil is 4,000 cubic feet per minute, and it's entering the coil at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And we want to know what is the leaving air temperature. So 55 degree air coming in, how warm is it going to be on the other side? So let's go to back to our heat, uh, excuse me, back to our air side heating equation of 1.08 times CFM times delta T. And we know the Q is 150,000. That's what left our water and entered the air. We know our CFM and we know our entering air temperature, but we can solve for our leaving air temperature. So if you run through that, you find out the air is going to come out at around 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And let's say this system is served by a hot water boiler with a 75% boiler efficiency. And we might want to know what's the required gas input because that's what we pay for from our utility company. 150,000 BTUs per hour divided by our 75% efficiency. Now our boiler input that we're paying for is 200,000 BTUs per hour. This previous example really illustrates this relationship between the water side system and the air side system. I mentioned earlier that these two systems are intrinsically linked. The performance of one impacts the performance of the other. And ultimately the heat transfer from one side of that equation is going to equal the heat transfer to the other side. It has to. That's, you know, fundamentals of thermodynamics. So the Q on the water side, the change in energy on the water side has to be equal to the change in energy on the air side. The systems are intrinsically linked. You change parameters on one, that will result in a change in parameters on the other. So if we change the water flow, that changes the delta T of the water. And if we change that, that will change the delta T of the air. Going the other way, if we change the airflow CFM, that's going to impact what's going on with the water. If we were to reduce the CFM through the coil, that would also reduce the heat transfer because we have less mass flow. And if there's less heat transfer, then that means a lower delta T on the water and vice versa. So everything here interacts. Boiler types. So there are really only two fundamental types of hot water boilers. Or it might be more, uh, more accurate to say two fundamental types of natural gas hot water boilers, which is most commonly what we have. We have non-condensing hot water boilers and condensing. Hopefully that's pretty easy to remember. Non-condensing boilers, that's old technology. There's nothing crazy about a non-condensing boiler. It heats up water, sends it out, that's the end of the story. There's nothing special about non-condensing boilers. And I'll get into where that term comes from here in a moment. If we have a gas-fired non-condensing boiler, that's about 80% efficient, which is true of really any natural gas-fired process. So we put in a certain amount of BTUs into the system. 
we get 80% output, and then the other 20% of the energy just goes out the boiler flue as waste gases. And we've talked about that before. Condensing boilers, though, are able to capture the heat energy from the moisture that is in the flue gases that we're dumping outside. What's going on is the moisture in those gases gets condensed and then the latent energy associated with that condensation is used to help heat our water. And ultimately what that means is there's less waste energy that's going out the flue. So that 20% of waste that we normally have, we are capturing some of the energy inherent in that through condensing the moisture that is in those flue gases. And that's where those terms, condensing boiler versus non-condensing boiler, that's where that term comes from. Condensing boilers, these are around 90 to 92% efficient, which means eight to 10% goes out the flue. So we can't capture all of the energy, but we can capture a good amount of it. And uh, if you recall back when we were talking about domestic hot water systems, I had a brief aside talking about condensing domestic hot water heaters, and those would operate on the same principle. So that's a lot of words, but let's see what that actually looks like. Here is a basic non-condensing boiler. So the, the pipe here, this is our hot water system. In this case, it's only showing one heating coil, but you could have a dozen heating coils out in the system, you know, maybe even 30 to 40 more. So we have our hot water entering the boiler here at a relatively cold temperature. We combust natural gas. Our airflow comes in. This is our combustion air. So we combust the gas here. And then as the water moves through the boiler, it heats up and heats up. And then we send it back out into the coils. And then out the top of the boiler, we have our flue gases. So that's our 20%. So we're just combusting gas, heating up the water, nothing crazy about this concept. And then 20% of that goes out the flue. So that's a non-condensing bare bones boiler. A condensing boiler has kind of a similar setup, but there is an important difference here. So we are still sending hot water out of the boiler right here and out into our heating coils, however many we have, and then it's coming back into our boiler right here. But the big difference here is that the flue gases, so let's, let's start on this side. We have our combustion air coming in, we're combusting it, we're heating up the water, but then this waste gas, instead of going straight out the top like it was in the non-condensing application, we're sending that through what is essentially a secondary chamber. So we're sending those flue gases through this secondary chamber and we are running our cold hot water through that secondary chamber. And what happens is if our hot water temperature, return temperature going into the boiler is below the dew point of these gases, it will condense water. So it's the same idea as having a cold glass of water on your desk that's below the dew point of the surrounding air and that causes it to condense on the outside of the glass. Similar concept here, except the dew point of these gases is still a pretty warm temperature, but as long as we can get below that point with our water here, if our water's cold enough, we can pull water out of the gases in this chamber and that releases energy and actually preheats the water a little bit. So you can see as we're going through the secondary chamber, the color gradient starts to change. We start to preheat the water a bit 
until we enter the primary chamber where we can finish the job. And so we still have that eight to 10% of energy lost through the flue gases. We still have to get rid of those flue gases, but we're just not losing as much energy as we were in a non-condensing application. And then our condensed water is going to drain because as that water condenses in this secondary chamber, well, we have to get rid of that water somehow. And so we have to take that to a drain somewhere. You can't just replace a non-condensing boiler with a condensing boiler and just expect a whole bunch of energy savings. So there are some pitfalls that you have to watch out for. And that leads us to the importance of the hot water return temperature. Ultimately, this serves as the basis of how much energy savings you're going to see with a condensing boiler. The condensing boiler savings are all based on lowering that hot water return temperature as it enters the boiler. The lower the return temperature, the more condensation you are going to see. <clears throat> and ultimately that means the more heat energy you're going to recover. So back to this simple schematic, the lower the temperature you can drive the system at this point as it enters the boiler, the more condensation you'll see and the more preheat you'll see <clears throat> as you go into this secondary chamber. And this kind of shows where those efficiency gains start. So if we look at these axes, we have boiler efficiency on the Y, inlet water temperature on the X axis, and this inlet water temperature, that is our hot water return because that is what is entering the boiler. And you can see if we have really hot, really hot, hot water coming into the boiler, this boiler is actually still pretty efficient at about you know, 84% as our inlet temperature goes lower and lower and lower. We can see we have some minimal efficiency gains, but then all of a sudden we hit this point and from there we start to see some significant efficiency gains. The reason being is that point right there is the dew point of our boiler flue gases. If our inlet water temperature is above this point, we have zero condensation going on. So we're not able to capture any of that moisture energy associated with condensing water out of the flue gases. Once our water temperature hits that dew point, that's where we start to condense. And that's why you see this big jump right here. And as we get colder and colder and colder, you can see we're able to capture <clears throat> more and more of that energy. So it's all about hitting that dew point, which is right around 130 degrees. It's still warm, um, but that's much colder than a typical hot water system, which would normally be in like the 160 to 180 range. So a condensing boiler system has to operate at lower temperatures. But if we're going to drive our hot water return temperature down, we also need to drive the hot water supply down. We can't just force the system to produce a colder hot water return temperature. It's only going to be driven by how much energy is getting pulled out of the system at the coils. And we can't just force that to, uh, to decrease. We have to correspondingly also drop the supply air temperature down. Effectively, we're reducing the average operating temperature of the system, which will have a corresponding reduction in the return temperature. But if our heating coils in the system, if they're all sized based on this 180 degree hot water temperature, 
you can't just drive the system down to 140 degrees and expect to heat the building the same as before. If you reduce the temperature of the system, you're going to reduce how much heat transfer you can get out of it. All of those coils were expecting and designed around 180 degrees. And now if we reduce it to say 140, that will reduce the heating capacity. And now that can become a problem on those really cold days, maybe the system can't keep up. If we're going to fully realize our condensing boiler savings, you might need to replace all the heating coils in the system and design for a lower hot water supply temperature. And what that means, as far as how you would redesign it, is if you have a lower temperature that you're working with, you might need more passes and more fins at the coils to obtain the same heat transfer as before for the same water flow and airflow. So if my old coil was designed for 100,000 BTUs per hour, but now I've lowered the temperature of my water system, if I still want 100,000 BTUs per hour, I need more passes and more fins to get the same heat transfer out of less cold, or excuse me, less warm water. So if we have a hot water coil, we might need more fins per inch, also called FPI because that gives more heat transfer surface area and will allow us to get more heat out of the water even if the water is at a lower temperature. Or alternatively, maybe we need more passes through the coil. You can also have multiple row coils. So this would be a one row coil. They make a different kind of coil where you actually have two rows back to back. So it still would serpentine through the coil, but it would do more of a zigzag pattern up and down that would give you two or maybe even three rows, which would give you again, um, more heat transfer surface area in addition to that extends how long the water is in the coil, which would give you more heat transfer as well. If you're talking to a boiler vendor, somebody trying to tell you, sell you a boiler, they may claim our boilers, they're up to 99% efficient. But the big question is, under what conditions can they be 99% efficient? If you had a graph that showed you the boiler efficiency relative to the return water temperature, because that's what this is all about. If you needed 50 degree hot water return temperature to achieve 99% efficiency at your boiler, you can't heat a building with water that that's cold. That, uh, the, if you're returning at 50 degrees, your supply is probably um, say 80 degrees it's really hard to heat a building with 80 degree water. So yes, it may be up to 99% efficient, but it may be under conditions which just don't make sense for your building and application. So just recall, if we're driving down the return temperature, that also means <clears throat> we have to drive down the supply. So if our return's at 50, our supply is also going to be relatively low and probably too low to reasonably heat our building. Typical design temperatures for a condensing boiler are about 140 degree supply and 110 degree return. But this can vary a bit, um, but that's, that's pretty common. And it's not unreasonable to heat a building with 140 degree supply water. And you can't just reduce the supply and return temperatures on a non-condensing boiler and expect to see savings. If you do that, you will see condensation, but the boiler is really not configured to take advantage of it. 
it doesn't have that secondary chamber that we talked about where you have that um, you know built to take advantage of the condensation you are going to see some condensation in the boiler if you do this uh, but you're just not going to see the efficiency gains that you would expect out of a condensing boiler additionally the condensate from the flue gases is acidic and a non-condensing boiler is typically not designed with the right materials to withstand acidic condensation. So if you do this on a non-condensing boiler, you will get condensation. The condensation will be acidic and that will start to eat away at your boiler. On a non-condensing boiler application, therefore it's important you keep that return water temperature high. You want it above 130 degrees, which is the dew point, because you don't want the condensation. So on a non-condensing boiler, it's the inverse philosophy. Keep the return water temperature high to prevent condensation from happening. If we're talking about some basic hot water plant energy savings measures, you could do a condensing boiler upgrade. We go in, we replace a non-condensing boiler system with condensing boilers. But as we discussed, you need to watch your supply and return temperatures. You might need to replace all of your heating coils. Otherwise, if you reduce the temperatures of the system to take advantage of your new condensing boiler, then uh, the heating system probably won't be able to keep up with the heating load of the building. Or um, another potential measure is if you walk into a building, you see they already have condensing boilers. Condensing boilers are already installed. Take a look at what their current operating temperatures are. Maybe those temperatures can be reduced to better take advantage of condensing operation and improve your efficiency. And the reason this might happen is old school boiler operators, they're trained to keep their return temperatures high because they are used to non-condensing boilers. And they just have it in their head that I need to keep my temperatures high to prevent condensation of inside my boilers. So they might have condensing boilers, but they might not understand that those condensing boilers are designed for those lower temperatures. So I've run into that several times where a customer has a condensing boiler hot water plant. Everything was designed for those lower temperatures, but the owner has just increased the temperatures up to 180 degrees because that's what they've always known. You could look at a fuel switch. Today, we've really been focused on natural gas boilers because that's what the bulk of them are but there are electric resistance boilers out there. If you find an electric resistance boiler, you could maybe convert that to a heat pump boiler, which are less common, but that is an option, especially nowadays with the, uh, the big push toward getting away from fossil fuels. So you could convert an electric resistance boiler to a heat pump boiler or a natural gas boiler if gas is available at that site. So that can either give you improved efficiency if you're going from resistance to a heat pump, or if you're going from resistance to natural gas, that'll be a reduced cost per BTU. You could have a steam to hot water conversion where you take a, an existing steam system and convert it to a condensing hot water system but you will need to add pumps because the old steam system didn't use pumps. You will very likely need all new piping and new hot water coils. Generally, you can't use the steam coils or the steam piping with the hot water system. And the reason being, if you have a steam system that is using a much hotter fluid and so if you're using a hotter fluid, that means your steam coils don't need to be as robust. 
You don't need as many passes with the pipe. You don't need as many fins per inch to get the heat transfer you need. So it's the same idea as going from a hot, hot water system to a less hot, hot water system. So you can't reuse the steam coils or the steam pipe, which means we got to replace all that. So that's going to be a very, very high cost. The payback is going to be absolutely awful. But uh, one of the recurring themes that I've mentioned a few times this semester is not all of these projects are driven by a good payback. I mentioned all of the issues with uh, steam systems. They are not very efficient. They're prone to leaks. There are potential safety concerns. And so we've we've dealt with a lot of customers who are just sick and tired of dealing with this old steam system and they want to go to hot water. And there are very likely going to be energy savings associated with that. But if you look at a cost versus savings perspective, the payback is always going to be very, very bad. That's it for water side heating systems. On the homework for this, you will have uh, another bin calculation. And as I mentioned earlier, those aren't going to go away. Uh, so I will talk to you all on Thursday. And until then, reach out if you got any questions. Thanks.